Revelation chapter 6. And while you're finding your place, I'll tell you about a man that I heard about who joined a monastery where they were committed to silence and after 10 years they could speak two words. And so the man lived through 10 years of silence and when it came time for him to speak, he said, hard bed. Well, another 10 years went by and he had a chance to speak again. And he said, bad food. 30 years later, he once again can speak. And he said, I quit. And the head of the monastery replied, I'm not surprised. You've done nothing but complain the whole time you've been here. <laughs> the book of Revelation, in many ways, is a book that when you come to it and consider it, it sounds like there's a lot of complaining. Because of the great troubles and trials that are coming upon the earth, and when we open to chapter 6, we're standing, as it were, looking down a long corridor, a hallway of time, in which we are allowed to see things, as he says in chapter 4, verse 1, that are to be hereafter. So what we are allowed to look at in these verses are things that are yet to come. I was in the grocery store with my wife the other day and at the checkout stand. Don't, aren't you glad that they have checkout stands like those where all those wonderful magazines are on display for you? And I saw a sign that said, New Prophecies of Nostradamus. I said, dear God, he's not been dead but about 600 years. I don't know how they got any new ones. But when you read that stuff, just right underneath it, junk. Because that's what those things are. But when you come to this book and God gives you a prophecy, please know that this is going to come just as God declares that it shall. We're looking down this corridor. Now in order to understand what he's going to say in these first eight verses of chapter 6, we have to be able to compare Scripture with Scripture. By the way, the best way to understand the Bible is to compare Scripture with Scripture. If you read a passage and it seems to say one thing, and you found something over here that says something else, you are getting a bad interpretation because the Bible never contradicts itself. And so when you learn to compare Scripture with Scripture, you'll see that the Bible is clear, concise, fits together like a hand and glove and that's what I want to share with you and show you today as we begin to look at what is commonly called the four horsemen of the apocalypse. But I want to read with you, beginning at verse 1, chapter 6. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder. One of the beasts, one of the four beasts, saying, Come, and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him. And he went forth conquering and to conquer. And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red. And power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another, and there was given unto him a great sword. And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld, and lo, a black horse. 
And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny. And see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was Death, and Hell followed with him. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword and with hunger and with death and with the beasts of the earth. Now who are these? We call them the four horsemen of the apocalypse. The word apocalypse is an unveiling. The uh, word apocalypse are those tra uh, traumatic and terrible things that are going to come upon the face of the earth as God opens our minds to see what is going to be during the tribulation period. Now all of us who are wise are aware of a time coming when Antichrist is going to rule upon the earth and when there's going to be, as the scripture declares it, tribulation, trouble, trial, such as never been in the history of mankind before. When men are going to beg for rocks to fall upon them and take their life, when there will be no ability to buy and sell except they, those uh, bear the mark of the beast. And such will be the time that is referred to in the book of Matthew of the Jews as the beginning or the time of Jacob's sorrows. When Antichrist is going to unleash the powers of hell against the nation of Israel and ultimately against the nations of the world in order to try and destroy the people of God as the ruler of the world. Now, who are these horsemen? Well, in order to understand, we must compare some scripture. Now, if God says one thing here, it ought to agree with what he has said in another place. Agreed? Amen. Well, in the book of Matthew, in chapter 24, beginning at verse 1, the Lord Jesus is speaking, and he is giving what we call uh, his uh, sermon on end time. Uh, his eschatological, for a big word, that the end times events. And so what uh, John says in Revelation ought to agree with what Jesus said in Matthew 24. Now notice that he says in beginning at verse 4, And Jesus answered and said unto them, for they had wanted to know what was the sign of his coming, and of the end of the world, or the end of the age. He says, Take heed that no man deceive you. Now there's the first key. For this one who is coming as the white horse rider is a deceiver. He is, this is not Jesus. So many people read the book of Revelation and they come to this chapter and they say because he's on a white horse and he's got a crown that, uh, and he's going forth to conquer, this is Jesus. No, this is not Jesus. This is the counterfeit Christ that you see. This is a deceiver that has come into the world. And my friend, just as so many today who do not understand the things of God nor the Word of God are being led astray and they read that and they say, well, that's Jesus. I want you to know that when the Antichrist comes, the Bible says that the mass of the, of the world is going to follow after him, believing that he is the Christ. And there's a reason for that, and I'll touch on it before I'm through here today. But uh, Jesus says there's going to be a deceiver. Verse 5. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. So verse uh, uh, 2 of Revelation, the white horse rider, and the deceiver described by Jesus are one and the same. And then in verse 4, he says, or, or pardon me, in verse 6, he says, And you shall hear of wars and rumors 
of wars and kingdom rising up against kingdom and nations shall rise up against nation. Here's the red horse rider, exactly like the Lord describes it in the uh, book of the Revelation. So the red horse rider, uh, the rider who brings war. Now the Antichrist, when he comes upon the earth, when he is released upon the earth, he is going to make a pact of peace with the nation of Israel for seven years. And he's going to abide by it or keep it for three and a half years. But then he'll break that pact of peace. But he comes as a prince of peace. Did not the Bible say that when Jesus came that he would be the prince of peace? And upon his shoulder would rest the governments of the world. And so when the deceiver comes, he is going to mimic. He is going to uh, counterfeit what the Lord Jesus Christ is and what he says. And so he's going to come feigning peace, but rather he is going to give the world war. Then in the book of Matthew, in chapter 7, you'll notice that he says that nations shall rise against nation and there shall be famines and pestilences. The word pestilence is not insects. The word pestilence is disease. And there's going to be famine and disease rampant upon the earth. We're living in a day where I believe we're seeing some of the superbugs that are developing in our world. They are resistant to all of the medicines that science can come up with. And uh, in the end times, in those days uh, when uh, the Antichrist is going to be released, uh, famine and death always brings disease with it. And those who know anything about uh, the, the uh, uh, way that science works, when there's pollution in the earth, disease comes out of that. And so we have war. And out of the war, there comes famine because people who are fighting cannot take care of the crops. And, and even if they do, there may be those who will destroy the crops. And so there's famine upon the earth. Men are hungry. Families are hungry. People are dying everywhere because of the famine that there is in the world. In America, we have never known a day like that. We have never known a famine. But if you read your Bible, and if you read the newspaper, you're aware that other parts of the world have known great famine. The Old Testament describes many of those times when people were dying by the tens of thousands. And in Ethiopia, not many years ago, we saw that when it happened. We saw that in some of those other African nations where famine swept through whole nations of the earth and where people died. They were stacked up in the street, thrown onto the ditches beside of the road where they had died and their bodies, the others couldn't even have the strength to bury them. And they just lay there and rotted. And in that there's all kind of disease that comes. God says that this is what's going to be the, the uh, atmosphere in the day of the great tribulation period. Now, folks, if I can stop just a minute and say to you, whatever you do, if you're here today and you do not know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, I want you to know that when Jesus comes and calls for the church and we're believing that it might even be today, he may call us out. We know that it's going to be soon from all of the indications from the Word of God. When that's going to be, I don't know. But those who are remaining upon this earth after the church is gone, you are in for the most awful time that uh, any man can even begin to imagine. And God says there's never been a time like that. And if you want to escape the wrath that is to come, you had better run today. Flee to the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Beg him for his grace. Plead for his mercy that God might wash you and cleanse your heart and give you his life so that you will be saved forever and forever. But the fourth horseman is the horseman of death. In Revelation chapter 6, he is referred to as the pale horse rider. Now folks, when war comes and when famine comes, death follows hard on the heel of those things. 
As a matter of fact, if you'll look, you'll see that the same rider who's on the white horse is on the red horse, is on the black horse, is on the pale horse. They're all Satan. They're all Antichrist. And the forces of the world are under his command. You see, the devil always promises what he doesn't pay. He says, I'll give you fame, but he may make you infamous, but it will not be famous. He promised you riches, and he may give you wealth, but he'll take it away from you and leave you with nothing. He'll promise you all of those things that the world is longing for only to find that he is a liar, the truth is not in him, and he is a robber and a thief. And he promises the world, if you'll follow me, if you'll do what I tell you, I'm going to give you peace. And so the world lines up behind him. Nations will submit themselves to him. And he is going to be the ruler of the world. But in the end, he declares himself that he is God. And he demands to be worshipped. And he controls the world, all right. But instead of bringing the peace and blessings that, that uh, he promised, he brings war and he brings famine and he brings death. Death will be wholesale. Did you notice in the concluding verse that I read in your hearing in Revelation chapter uh, uh, 6? He says that there is given uh, power over the fourth part of the earth to kill with the sword. And so uh, in this moment of time, here you're going to have, and I'll deal with it in another sermon, how that uh, the people in just short order, back to back, that great numbers, millions of people are going to be wiped out as the Antichrist takes command and takes control and the world is thrown into war and the minds are thrown into consternation and the world is grappling for any kind of answer, but there is none because the Antichrist is a liar and the truth is not in him. Well, Matthew and uh, Revelation then agree. Put them side by side and they agree. But what about Daniel? Daniel is that great Old Testament prophet who uh, many of us know that uh, uh, his prophecy and the prophecies of Revelation work hand in hand. And if you'll go to Daniel in chapter 7, beginning at verse 19 through verse 28, you'll find that he begins to describe here in that chapter the things that are going to be upon the earth. And he describes the kingdoms that are going to be. And in this chapter, we're dealing, beginning at verse 19, with the fourth of the kingdoms. I believe that fourth kingdom is now in process of being formed. I believe it's the revised are uh, 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 revitalized uh, Roman Empire. And we're seeing it come together today in what we call the European common market nations. And they're going to come together and they're going to coalesce and they're going to put their powers together and it will be that nation that Antichrist will use as the basis of his power, his political power, in order to take over the control of the world. Not only will he take over that nation, but he's got, there's going to be a, a one world government. And by the way, I want you to understand that those of us who know anything at all know that the United Nations are designed to create a one world government. No wonder that crowd stood against America when she decided that we needed to go in and clean up the mess in other parts of the world because they are designed to create a one world government. And uh, the revived Roman Empire will be that part of the world that Antichrist is going to use as his political base. Then the European dollar, the euro, is going to become the, uh, the monetary system that Antichrist will control in order to control the commerce of the world. And, dear friend, there's going to be one world religion. Now, I'm going to come back to that in more detail in just a moment. But Antichrist, as a genius, is going to be able to control the uh, political world, the military world, the economic world, and the religious world in order to rule the earth. And he is going to do it, whatever the cost to humanity. So the stage is being set. How is it all happening, preacher? Well, turn to the New Testament, the book of 1 Th 2 
Thessalonians. Second Thessalonians. This is a passage that you should not miss as you consider what God has to say. Second Thessalonians, a passage that many, I think, read and don't realize what God is saying. Chapter 2, verse 3. He says, let no man deceive you. That means don't let any antichrist deceive you. Don't let some liberal preacher deceive you. Don't let some uh, misguided Sunday school teacher deceive you. Don't let some political science professor deceive you. Let no man deceive you by any means or any method. For that day shall not come. Listen now. That day, the day of the coming of the Lord, the day of of the uh, release of the Antichrist upon the earth, that day shall not come except there come a falling away first and that man of sin, that's the Antichrist, be revealed the son of perdition. Now falling away is a word that in the Greek language uh, is, uh, we get our English word apostasy from. Apostasia. Our English word apostasy. Those who have turned around. Those who have gone back. Those who have taken a different position. And today, my brothers and sisters, we are seeing this happen. There is a movement toward a one world church, a one world religion, and it's happening quicker than most of us can begin to know. Now listen to this. How is this taking place? Several ways. First of all, in our world, there is a move to sexual license. That began back along about 1940 when a man uh, came forth supposedly as a learned man and he began to tell the world that the cause of all of earth's problems is because we are uh, sexually inhibited. And so he began to tell uh, in his Kinsey report uh, things that men had never heard before. By the way, Playboy took that report and began to build on it and built an empire that we know as the pornographic world of the Playboy society. And so it was out of that report. And one of the things that he said in that report is that 10% of the earth's population is homosexual. Now, we believe that. Nobody ever stopped for a long time to question whether that was right or not. But let me just tell you that he got most of his data from people who were in prison. Hello? That's not the common world. Did you not know that? That's not ordinary people, those that are in prison. Oh, they're ordinary, all right, but they're incarcerated. And what he found was that 10% of the earth's population was homosexual. They had engaged in homosexual acts. And so he put that in his report, and people accepted it as gospel. And when you accept that kind of lie, it begins to build, and people begin to build upon it. And what we're seeing today is that America is being sold on a perverted idea to perverted acts, and people are submitting to and giving themselves over to that form of perversion that God says is an abomination in His sight, and no nation that has ever turned to that kind of perversion has survived. Let me show you what I mean. You ought to know by now that I don't shoot unless my powder's dry. And I want to tell you, I've done some study recently in the area of, of Egyptian archaeology. It's amazing what you can learn out of dirt. And so uh, the, the Egyptian uh, nation, as a nation, in the long ago was one of the most powerful nations in the history of the world. They, they, uh, one of the seven wonders of the world is right there with the uh, pyramids and with the Sphinx. And uh, when you see uh, the, the, the uh, reproductions of what those great temples must have looked like, I mean, they had buildings that would challenge anything that we have in our world today. But until recently, and I just learned this, it blew me away. When I began to read uh, some of the things that they have in those hieroglyphic uh, things there, one of the things that they had fallen into was that they had fallen into a perverted world of homosexuality. And when you begin to fall into those things, God just says, I ain't going to put up with that. And if you want to find out where they were, you have to dig up the sands in the desert to find them. 
And that same thing happened to the nation of Rome. Rome was the mightiest nation in the world. Rome controlled the world. But they fell into the shame and the, the disgusting methods of the, of the perversion of sexuality, whether it was homosexuality or whether it was in uh, orgies or however else you want to describe it. And God just said, enough is enough. And if you want to know what they were, you have to read it in some history book to find out. And I want to tell you right now, my friend, America today is the only superpower there is left on the face of the earth. But don't you think that God will not judge America and that he can bring us down just like he did the other nations of the world? Write it down and read it and understand what God would say. The church today is so fraught with homosexuality that with a church is becoming the method by which the devil and his crowd are luring the rest of the world into that shameful, sinful practice. You say, preacher, not in the church. Have you not read the newspaper lately? Do you not know what's happening in the Catholic church? Do you not know of all the priests that are being sued? Do you not know of those who have been charged and found guilty? Do you not know that they're shutting down churches now because they're trying to keep from bankrupting the whole situation because of the, of the charges and the fines that have been assessed against them because of what was going on uh, in that, in the priesthood? You say, well, that's in a different group. That's not us. Hang on. In 1979, the Episcopal Church ordained a lesbian by the name of Ellen Barrett to the priesthood. In 1972, the United Church of Christ, which is the uh, heirs of the old Puritans, they ordained a homosexual. In 2004, the Episcopal Church named its first homosexual bishop. And I want you to understand that the Methodists barely turned it down in their meeting a year ago. And in the yesterday's paper, you saw where a Baptist has just been named a Baptist pastor in charges that he himself is engaged. Now I want to tell you, I'm saying all this to say to you, my friend, we can blame it on the society, but the enemy is in our own gates. And we need to be aware, we need to stand sit still, we need to be staunch, we need to say we love the sinner, but we hate the sin, because God says that he hates the sin. And Satan is selling America down the, down the uh, track. And we're losing. And even the church is being watered down and washed away. And God will judge us because of that. Now I said all that to say this. The move to establish a one world church, a one world religion is well underway. And when that comes about, I'm going to shock you now. I personally believe, I can't prove it, except what I see going on. I personally believe that the God of the one world church will be a woman, a female. Because right now, they're rewriting the Bible, new translations, where they're turning God into a woman. And Sophia, the goddess of wisdom, the same thing that Satan tempted Eve with, when he said, if you'll eat of this fruit, you'll be like God. You'll understand all things. And when she saw that the fruit was good to make one wise, and so the goddess will be Sophia. It's already happening, folks. In circles that I don't have time to describe to you, they are already making prayers to a female goddess. And folks, please hear me. The stage is set. The Antichrist is just at the point of being revealed. I believe he's already on this earth, alive and well, has been trained and is being prepared for the day that he will take over. And I'm not looking for the Antichrist. 
I'm looking for the Christ for he's coming to take the church home. It might be today and folks I hope it is today and I hope that all of us are ready and if you're watching by television or over the internet I'm praying that you'll get in and get right before the coming of the Lord. He's coming and it might be today. Well, there's a move to establish a one world church and may I say to you that a lot of what's going on in our church world is stuff that is going unnoticed by the average person. As a matter of fact, I believe that much of what we see going on in our new age church, in our uh, new day church, in our contemporary style church is just another step in order to move the church to a point to where they're willing to, to unite with, put their arms around, engage in, and become a part of a one world church. Now what do I mean by that? Well, uh, listen to this. In the new age, in the new style church, the move is uh, that they will downplay doctrine. Don't preach doctrine. I promise you one thing, if you'll go to one of the happy clappy churches where they uh, just sing 7-Eleven songs and where they uh, don't ever do anything, they don't preach on the book of Revelation. They don't preach on doctrine. Uh, they want to say, why, we're all just alike. Why, if you come to our church, we're going to meet your felt needs. And they preach silly little sermons on how to be successful. And they'll preach sermons on feeling good about yourself. And they'll preach uh, sermons on uh, 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 methods whereby you can get rich. And you walk away saying, why my needs were met today. By the way, who sold that line? It wasn't Jesus. Jesus didn't say that you're to feel good when you come to church. As a matter of fact, there ought to be times when you get under conviction when you come to church. You ought to feel bad because you've got sin in your life. If you've got sin in your life, the Holy Ghost of God ought to sit out on your soul and you'll be willing and ready to rush to an altar to be cleansed by God. You see, my needs are not met by the preacher. My needs are, are my felt needs are met by my high priest. For the Bible says that I have a high priest who is touched by the feelings of my infirmities. My needs are met by my Savior Jesus. My sins are forgiven by my Savior. My mind is renewed by my Savior. My faith lifts me up above the shadows where I walk with my Savior. My prayers bring heaven down and His Word instructs and it guides and it leads and it feeds and it nourishes and it blesses and the, the Spirit of the Lord moving in the church prepares us to live in a hostile world but the counterfeit church is a church of the fat cat televangelist with Hollywood entertainment with pink haired women who are praying to raise dead chickens uh, and, and uh, they pamper poodles and they peddle vitamins and creams and olive oil and, and mascara that's the world of the modern day church but friend, that's the church that when the Antichrist comes, they'll clap their hand and proclaim him to be the Savior of the world. Well, the rider of the four horses is the same. The white horse is the counterfeit Christ. The red horse rider is the counterfeit Christ. Trying to produce a counterfeit world kingdom, just like Jesus is going to establish when he comes back to this earth. And the black horse is the result of the wars and famine. The pale horse is death, the real face of the Antichrist. You see, he purports peace, but he gives war. He proposes answers, but only produces confusion. He presents a kingdom, but is the kingdom of destruction and not blessing. Today's world is searching for the all-wise, uniting, political leader. And folks, there have been many antichrists. The Bible tells us that even from the day of, of John, he said that the spirit of antichrist is already at work in the world. There have been others who have done this. Hitler said, I'm going to give the world a mighty ruler and a power. But in order to do so, I've got to kill all the Jews. Sounds like antichrist, doesn't it? 
Stalin said, I'm going to produce a one world power under the USSR. And in order to do so, I'm going to annihilate the Jews. Saddam Hussein hated the Jews. Bin Laden, Zarqawi, and many other world leaders. It's the Jews, stupid. They're the problem. Get rid of them and you'll solve all the problems of the earth. What's this guy's name that just died? Arafat. Isn't it strange that they gave that guy the Nobel Prize for world peace? And all he gave was pieces of the bodies of people that he had blown up. But he hated the Jews. And my brothers and sisters, when Antichrist comes, it will be with a venom, a hatred toward the Jewish world like you can't even begin to know. And it will be his intent to wipe the world clean of every Jew. With the white horse, which is a symbol of purity, a conqueror, he says, look at me. He's given a, a uh, crown. But please note, if you're a student of the word of God, that is the word Stephanos, a crown that's given to one who has won a race, won a victory. It's a worldly crown, not a heavenly crown. You want to see Jesus go over to the book of Revelation chapter 19 and they say bring forth the royal diadem. It's a heavenly crown that he has. This is not Jesus. This is the Antichrist. And his effort is to destroy. His method is to kill. His kingdom will be a kingdom in which he is going to rule the world and bring great struggle and trial. In Daniel, he says that the kingdom will be given to the saints of God. In Matthew, this is the coming of Christ in power that concludes that portion of time we know as the tribulation. And in John, he said, and I, John, saw the holy city come down from heaven from God. And it's going to be a kingdom that the world will rejoice in. And Revelation eleven fifteen says, the kingdoms of the world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ. So friend, the end of the book is, Antichrist don't win. It may look like he has for a while, but I want you to know that Jesus Christ is the King of Kings. And it's only he who is going to rule in the world. And I got news for you. All of God's children, all of God's children, going to rule and reign with him upon this earth. Have you got a place in the kingdom? Have you made sure that your heart is submitted to him? Are you living pure so that he might in that time of his kingdom say, you've been faithful over a few things. I'll make you ruler over many things. It puzzled me for a long, long time why God would say, when, he, when I come, will I find faith upon the earth? Until I realize that our world is being ripped of its faith and caused to look at things that tantalize the flesh rather than submitting to the Lord God and seeking his kingdom, both in our hearts and in the world to come. What's that I hear? Is that the sound of a trumpet? My friend, Jesus is coming. I trust, I pray, I've prayed for you today that you'll make certain in your heart and you'll submit your all unto him, the Lord Jesus, as your Christ. If you're here this morning and there's anything in your life displeasing to God, put it on an altar, for Jesus is coming for the church. You don't want any baggage left in your life that you wouldn't want to take with you to heaven. You don't want anything in your world that when he examines it, he would not say, oh, that's good. Well done, good and faithful servant. If you're here and you've never trusted him as your savior, don't delay. On this stanza of our hymn, the first, the first chords, 
You ought to be down the aisle saying, I want to confess Christ as my Savior, as my Lord. I want to trust Him as the one who can write my name in the Lamb's book of life. If you're here and God's moving in your life and there's some need, if you need to move your membership into a church that believes and preaches and teaches the Word of God, then you ought to come this morning as we sing and be prepared and understand Antichrist is already at work and we're waiting for the Christ to take us out so that he might be released on the earth. Pray with me.